Hey guys, Colin here, hope you're well. Today we're going to be taking a look at a Banload sample, which is a banking trojan which targets Portuguese users, and it's got quite a nifty anti-analysis technique built into it, which I'm going to show you how to overcome, so you can then perform some additional analysis in your lab environment. I'm going to talk about lab setup as well, just in terms of the networking side of things. I'm going to show you some really uh, super useful tools and techniques that you can use to uh, overcome and patch malware, uh, and also kind of breakpoint on stuff as well, which may not be loaded at runtime within a particular binary. So uh, lots to cover in today's session. This is the sample we're going to take a look at. It was uploaded to Virus Total just a few days ago. Uh, there's plenty of these samples floating around as well, so plenty, plenty of you, plenty of them to choose from. If you don't have an intelligence account with Virus Total, you won't see this download file button. Uh, however, you can search for the hash and you can get it elsewhere online as well. Uh, I'm going to use in this 32-bit Windows 7 VM here to, for, for my analysis today. Just a quick talk about the uh, the network inside of things, how this is set up. This virtual machine is on its own custom VM net adapter. It's isolated from the internet. It doesn't have any internet connectivity whatsoever, which is great. So it's in a nice kind of safe environment. But that's no good for malware, right? Because malware quite often wants to reach out to the internet and either download some additional payload or it will reach out to its C2 for whatever reason. Uh, and so we need to kind of like fool it into thinking it's connected to the internet so we can elicit that networking uh, indicator a compromise. So have a look at my LAN settings here. Let's go into IPv4. Uh, my properties here, uh, oops, and go into IPv4. Uh, we can see that I've got a static IP address uh, on a particular subnet for the VM net. Uh, and we can see my default gateway and my preferred DNS server is a .132 address. So that's uh, another virtual machine which is on the same subnet. Well, that virtual machine belongs to uh, my Remnux distribution. Let me type in ifconfig. And we can see here that um, the IP address is the .132 address. Uh, and that means that all of my internet traffic uh, and DNS requests are going to be routed through to um, my Remnux distribution. So I'm going to run fake DNS. And that's going to reply with any... Um, uh, DNS, well, it's going to give DNS replies to any DNS requests that come through from my Windows virtual machine. And also I'm going to run INET SIM as well, and that's going to produce uh, a load of TCP responses for the various services that are listed there as well. So that's cool. It's also going to give me a nice little log file of any requests that are made by the malware. So flipping back here, let me close out the network side of things. That's cool. Uh, so we've got the networking uh, traffic that's being piped through to my Linux distribution. Um, I've also got Process Hacker here uh, up and running, and I've got Process Monitor going. I've got some filters here for when processes are created, when anything is written, and also when processes exit as well. Hit Control and E, and we'll get those filters going. I'm going to got the malware here on my desktop. Let me double click it, and we'll get going with it. You can see here I've double clicked it and nothing happened, didn't see anything in Process Hacker. Let me double click it again and maybe double click it one more time for good measure uh, and go back to Process Monitor. We can see, yeah, the process did create, but then it exited. Process is created, then it exited, then it created, then it exited. So, not, so the malware is opening, but it's doing some, some kind of check uh, and then it's exiting for whatever reason. Maybe it knows it's in a virtual machine, maybe it's got some other trick under its sleeve uh, and that's our job here to find out exactly what it's doing and why it's not executing in our environment. Let me just flip to the networking side of things. We can see there was no DNS request in there either. So it's not as if it's trying to do something for it with that side of things. Uh, so let me just kind of pause my filter for Procmon just for one second. Uh, and now what we're going to do is we're going to use API Monitor. This is a super cool tool that you can use uh, in your own lab and it will monitor API calls that are used by uh, particular binaries. So I'm going to basically monitor everything. I'm going to monitor new process and I'm going to point it to my malware sample that's on my desktop here. Click open, then click OK. And you can see here on the right hand side, it's going to list all of the API calls that are associated with uh, the malware executing. That's cool. So um, what I want to do though, rather than go from the top down, I'm going to go from the bottom up because I'm interested in what happened shortly before the malware exited. And we can see here that like I've got loads of memory stuff going on. So like um, you know, heap free, delete cri critical section, TLS free, that kind of stuff is like the operating system closing down and just releasing memory back to the OS, um, which is great. We're not really interested in that. What we're interested in finding is uh, an API call, which is maybe uh, something uh, outside of the ordinary or, or outside of uh, all of this memory stuff. Uh, and right before it happens, we can see here. So right before all this virtual free stuff and free virtual memory, blah, 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 we can see here there's an API call for get system default lang ID. And this API call does exactly what it says on the tin, right? So it's going to get the default language identifier from the system. And in fact, we can even Google it, get system default lang ID. Uh, let me go to the MSDM page and we can see what the return value of that particular API call will be. Um, and we'll just give it a second to load here. We can see here the return value is the language identifier for the system locale. And we've got these language identifier constants and strings as well. So a nice tabulated view. We've got all these locale um, identifiers. And then um, Microsoft has kindly given us what language um, or locale that, that actually equates to. 
So that's cool, right? So we know what the malware is using. We've got this particular API call that we need to kind of investigate a little bit further. Uh, let me just get rid of this from uh, API Mon. Uh, we'll just close this out for a second. And what we need to do now is disassemble the malware and find out where it's using that particular API call. Can we stick it in x32dbg, alt f9 to get to the user code? Uh, and in fact, when we have a look from the entry point, I don't have to look very far. Just a few lines down here, we can see the API call to get system default lang ID. So that's cool, right? I didn't really have to do any investigating uh, for, for where this was going to be using or find it within the binary it's pretty much one of the first instructions that or first checks that, are, that seem to be made uh, by the malware uh, when it executes what we're actually interested in though is the line after that call to get system default lang id we can see there's a comparison to whatever whatever is in the ax register which is going to be the return value for that particular api call and it's going to compare it to the value of 416 which is hexadecimal 0416 uh, so that's cool, right? So um, the return value for get system default lang ID is going to be stored in AX. That's going to be compared to 416. And then we can see after it, right? It's going to make a, a there's a conditional jump. So we've got jump if equal to zero. Um, and what's equal to zero? Well, that will be the comparison um, between AX and 416. So if they equal if they're equal to each other, then that's going to the um, zero flag is going to be set, and therefore the jump will um, will be taken. And we're going to come down here. We'll we'll take a push. There's a few calls, and and therefore the malware is going to subsequently execute. If it doesn't equal 416 then we're going to just like jump uh, skip over that jump we're going to uh, xor e eax move itself which is zero out we're going to take a few pops and then we're going to move into here we're going to move edx into fs0 eax is going to be zero at this point so it's going to be fs0 and then when you see fs0 um, mentioned in your code that is the start of a structured exception handler routine or seh routine and that's where the malware is going to be closing down, right? It's kind of like if you imagine it in a higher level language, like a try catch exception block. Uh, so you're, you're in the kind of exception code now uh, and, and effectively the malware will uh, un undoubtedly start to finish up at that point. So what we need to do then is take a set a breakpoint on the uh, comparison. We're going to press F9 to get there. And we can see here, right, the return value in AX, uh, which is the lower portion of the of the EAX register, I've got 0409. And that's going to be compared to 0416. Um, OK, so they obviously don't match. And therefore, that uh, conditional jump is not going to be taken. Uh, and so that's not good, right? That's obviously one of the reasons why the malware is going to be closing down. So let me just go back to the default language identifiers here. We can search for 0416. And we can see that actually that equates the Portuguese. So this malware is looking to see whether the system locale settings are actually set to Portuguese. Mine was set to 0409. Type it in right, we can see here that that equates to English US. So my virtual machine is set to English US, which is probably the default. I've never really changed it. Um, and therefore, that's no good, right? This malware won't execute in this environment. Two ways we can patch it. We First off, we can patch the value in the register. We can press Enter, and we can just change that to 416. And that means that, that uh, conditional jump will then be taken. But if you want to actually permanently fix this uh, particular uh, trick in the malware, you, you can actually patch the jump. So rather than it being a conditional jump, you can just make it to be an unconditional jump. So we'll press Space. We'll keep the size. And instead of being jump if equal, we're just going to say jump, um, which is JMP. And therefore, the malware will always jump to that point and it will skip over that structured exception handler routine. So I'm going to save that. I'm going to patch the file. I'm going to save it, patch it as patched.exe. That's great. That's patched and that's done. So let me come out of my debugger here. I've now got patch.exe here. Um, and hopefully what we'll find is that the malware is going to execute for us and we'll find out um, you know, a few more indicators from it. Let me just double check what we've got going here. So we've got our fake DNS um, server up and running. We've also got our TCP services uh, being listened to by iNet SIM. Uh, so I think uh, the only thing left to do is to activate the filters again in um, Procmon. So let me do that, press Control and E, and we'll get the uh, the events being captured. And we'll double click patch.exe, and hopefully we see patch.exe come up in Process Hacker this time, so it doesn't immediately close down by the looks of things either, which is good. So it's obviously doing something under the hood, is ticking away in the background. And now what we need to do is find out exactly what it's doing, um, and hopefully we'll see something from our Remlux distribution. And we do flip back to that, and we can see here, right? I've got this DNS request to this .com.br address. So we've now managed to elicit some kind of networking activity from the malware, which is great. So let me stop my uh, INET SIM session here, and we can see here that I've got 14 lines of text written to the log file uh, that's reported to here. So I'm going to do sudo cat var log INET SIM 
report report dot two six three seven dot text and we can see here right i've got a load of get requests so i've got the get request to that dot com dot br but we can see the full path here from my net sim that's managed to capture everything for us so sh three a one dot agg a two a four and a three dot agg all of those requests have been made. And actually, iNet Sim does, a, does you a favor. It kind of responds back with a fake response as well. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. But now we've got four key network indicators out of the malware, which previously we weren't, weren't able to elicit. Let's flip back here. Let's go to Procmon and let's kind of see what happened here, right? So we can see patch.exe. And let me just kind of include that as a filter. We can see actually it wrote a few files to the disk as well. So it wrote it to the public directory uh, and also it tried to create uh, a process of Red Server 32. So that's interesting. Let me maximize the screen here just a little bit so we can see what, what it was doing. We can see the full command line as well. So it tried to, act, it tried to actually execute um, what's probably a DLL because that's why you'd use Red Server 32, um, which was stored in the app data roaming folder. So we've got a few zip files uh, and a few files uh, that have been written to the public directory as well. So that's cool, right? And we can see them here. So if we have a look in W, uh, we can open it in Notepad. And we've got some stuff which the malware is probably using as like a config or whatever. Um, so cool. Again, we've now got some, uh, some file system activity out of the malware as well. So what I'm interested in now then maybe is kind of poking around the malware a little bit more and finding out how it was building that network connection. So what first thing I need to do is you need to remove these files if we're gonna run the malware again, uh, because actually this particular sample will look for itself to see whether it's been previously infected or not. Uh, and if it is, then it will subsequently not execute and that's something else you'll have to overcome, but easy enough to do it if you just delete the, uh, delete the uh, files from the public, public directory. So uh, what we wanna have a look at though is how did that malware uh, what API calls did it make to actually make that network connection? Well, one of the things you could do is you could have a look at the uh, sample and have a look at the imports, for example. So you could use the likes of P Studio, for example, and that will give you an idea of the imports uh, and maybe kind of suspicious imports as well. So you can see the libraries that are involved and also the API calls. Uh, they're associated with the uh, with the particular sample as well. Interestingly enough, I don't see anything here which jumps out at me, which gives it any um, imports which are related to network creating network connections. So that's in, that's interesting, right? So the malware uh, is obviously has a load of API calls which it references uh, to begin with, and it imports straight away. But actually, what it appears, what it might appear in this particular case is the malware is using um, a module which it loads at runtime. So it might, it might actually load a DLL a little bit further down the code. It might not import it straight away and it'll appear in its import address table. So that's a neat little trick by the malware. Uh, and we need to kind of find out what module it's loading and maybe what API calls are associated with it. So API mon to the rescue again. Um, let me just uh, restart my INET sim session just so we get some kind of valid responses coming back here. What I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna monitor the uh, patched program instead of the original binary. So we'll monitor the patch program, which hopefully will continue to execute and actually give us that network, in, um, that network uh, connectivity. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to filter out the, the network inside of things and see what API calls and modules are associated with that. So let's just make sure, let's go back here. We can see indeed we've got the same network in, uh, network DNS request. So let me filter out, let me go .com .br. And we can see, right, we do in fact have um, the, the strings being built up and we can see the module here, which is associated with the network and co connections is winhttp.dll. Well, that's great. We didn't actually see that in the malware's import address table. So that's definitely something of interest to us and we wanna be able to poke around that a little bit further in our disassembler. So let me uh, again, just once again, tidy up the malware. So we're gonna delete these files just so we can play around with it again in our lab environment. Delete and delete. Okay, that's great. And actually what I'm gonna do is just uh, remove these uh, processes from API mom for one second. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna flip back to, let's go into patched and we'll flip it back into x32 dbg. So now what we actually wanna do is we wanna, uh, we want a method of being able to uh, break, set a breakpoint on uh, an API call which is not actually loaded at runtime. Well, x64 has uh, a super useful plugin called Breakpoint Unresolved. And if you install the plugin in your plugins directory, it gives you access to a command line called BU, and that gives you access to Breakpoint. If you type in the module followed by uh, the API call that you're interested in. So I'm gonna break point in win HTTP and the API call that I'm interested in is win HTTP open. So let me press enter and you can see here that it's added a, an unresolved breakpoint. Uh, so this is an API call which is not yet resolved in the malware, but at some point in the future, in case it does become resolved, then uh, we've got a breakpoint for it already in our code. So that's super useful. So I'm gonna press F9 again 
Hopefully what we're going to see is the malware execute and then we'll hopefully see it pause on win HTTP open, which is one of the API calls which are associated obviously with opening a network connection and boom, we've got it here. So it breakpointed on win HTTP open and now we're in a position where we, we've got like the user agent string, we can see uh, we're, in, we're in the HTTP module code, right? But we can, we can kind of start to poke around it. We can see it's a get request and we can see all of the stuff being built. So we can see the, uh, the C2 indicators within the code. We can press Alt and F9 actually gets the user code and now we're in the functions that are associated with building that network connection. So hopefully that's of useful to you. Um, you know we've seen a, a, a few really interesting things there, which are uh, associated with malware, which has got anti-analysis techniques built built into it. I've shown you how to kind of pipe your network traffic through to, through from one VM into another, so you can perform some um, uh, networking. Analysis from that side of things. We've looked at some Procmon filters. We've looked at how to use API Mon, how to patch the malware using X64, and also how to use that super useful plugin called Break, Breakpoint Unresolved, which is super useful indeed. So hopefully that's of use to you. Hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you have, feel free to like and subscribe to my channel. You can also follow me on Twitter at CyberCDH, and I look forward to your comments as well. Thanks, guys.